Good evening, everyone. Well, one way to increase uh, spay and neuter services is one, number one is outreach in the community. There, the city has ample services that um, need to be utilized more. And I believe that outreach is gonna be able to uh, educate residents on using these services to their, to their uh, benefit. And then also working with local uh, organizations, uh, animal organizations to help promote uh, spay and neuter services as well. Yeah, I think the model that we've seen be very effective is getting out into community and bringing those services to people. Every day, right, if you have to get in your car, take your animal, right, to somewhere, wait in line, then you gotta go through that program, then you gotta pay for spay neuter services, the likelihood that someone is gonna do that gets to be smaller and smaller. I think the model is for a council member like myself to open up community spaces and say, they're gonna be free if you offer free spay neuter. We're gonna help you promote, and I'm gonna help you do block walks to get the word out. Not just sitting at home and saying, well, I sent an email blast or I let you put my name on that event. Let's be active. And we have to make sure that spay neuter services are something we are being proactive about and not reactive about. Uh, well, thank you. Whoa. <laughs> um, spay and neuter is really at the heart of, of what I think the, the biggest solution is, is making sure that we have good access, you know, that's um, low cost, no cost spay and neuter services available. So, but your question was, how do we get more of that at Bark? I think part of that is that we need to build partnerships. We, we, we rely so heavily on partners to, to provide additional services. You know, at Bark is a city facility, and so they, they operate on funding. So, you know, prioritizing that is, a, is, a, is an important need um, because we are not spaying and neutering enough animals. The, the numbers that, you know, that are required to um, to, to make it happen, just you know, we're not we're not funding it enough. So um, so it, we, Bark can't do it alone. You know we need we need our partners, and that includes really everybody. Thank you. Specifically in District H, we are, uh, District H is plagued with a lot of homeless animals and um, people, families cannot enjoy walking to, down the street to a, a park or to a grocery store. And so one thing that I, I think is necessary is that um, we have to make spay and neuter services, like they mentioned earlier, accessible. Um, and we have to change the culture in, in District H community, which is 72% 70, Latino community, uh, change the culture and help families understand uh, the importance of spay and neuter and education. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, so this is one more thing. So, you know, what do you say are the thoughts on addressing homeless animals in your district? Mm -hmm. And an, another component of that is um, I really believe in an ordinance of requiring spay and neuters, neut neutering uh, throughout Houston. Um, and in saying that, we do have to uh, have uh, grants or funding available so that families have access to that. So I think the ordinance is going to be a, a, a huge solution um, if we can get that done. Yeah, so we already have spay neuter ordinances, right? If you're adopting an animal, we already say that's a, a requirement. And I think one of the issues is making sure that we invest in bark and see investing in bark as a public safety and a public health issue, right? Rescuing animals is not just about, oh, I saw an animal and I feel bad. If we don't take dogs off the streets, it's their livelihood that's affected. If we don't take dogs off the streets, people aren't walking in communities, right? Postal workers are being attacked and they can't deliver medication and bills to homes. So we have to sit at city council and people are gonna tell you, well, that's the mayor and he's gonna decide if he has money. I think the job of a council member is to say, that's Everest and we gotta get to it. But I can't take the next safest step, which is saying, well, you know, it's Latinos who have a problem with it, right? We have to say we need to invest in bark so that there's more capacity for them to take in animals or else people wait in line for four hours and drop their animal on the side of the road, right? And that's how we get more and more homeless animals because we are not giving them a spot to do the right thing. So homeless animals, that's kind of a special situation. You know, a lot of the, the um, spay-neuter efforts are really geared towards um, those of 
that are pets, you know, that there's an owner that, that is responsible and that we're convincing them to come in for spay neuter. Homeless animals, the ones that are just really street animals, that's a, that's a different situation. And, it, and it's very challenging. And I don't think we're doing a very good job at all on this. And I would just want to tip my hat to you know, the, um, the animal rescue community who, who, who really does address it in a, in a really strong way. But there are, there are other cities that, that have done a better job than us. And I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, that, that eventually Houston can be you know, more like, like they do in Colorado, you know, that they will do a much better job and that we're not going to have all these animals on the street. But it takes a while to get there. And it takes, it takes some leadership at the state level. We need legislation that, that supports the work that we're doing, you know, to, to, to reduce those numbers. And, um, but but you know, they need spay neuter too. But, you know, that, that if, the, if, you know if, if it's a homeless animal, they, they also need to be spay neuter. But that we just are not set up in a, in a really effective way to be dealing with that right now. Advocate for Animals, I actually am a board member of the Northside Dogs, which is a local um, organization that has started in the near Northside community. Uh, we're actually branching out into different areas just to kind of help spread the word about animal wel welfare and promote education on proper pet care. And so uh, working with in low-income communities, um, again, it's just education. It's education, it's outreach, and it's walking, um, doing the footwork that's needed to reach people to get the word out. Um, uh, and again, having funding accessible, available, that's reachable uh, to, uh, for, for different types of services, spay neuter services, chipping. Um, and so it's, it's just really working with community partners, using your contacts in the, in the community, developing relationships, and showing the importance of spay and neuter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Y'all are all parts of organizations that are doing this great work, Huts for Mutts, RPM, right, and others. Um, and I think what it takes is, as an elected official, using my network. So when I campaign, I go block walking, every single neighborhood, every single block, door to door. What I'm proposing as a city council member is to do community block walks. And what if once a quarter we brought together multiple organizations, health, right, safety, environmental, affordable housing, and y'all in the, in the animal rescue community, and we said, let's go together. Let's carry each other's flyers. Let's increase our capacity and let everyone know about the great work y'all are already doing. Because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to maximize the resources we have now and help y'all get the word out and get people invested in those resources. Okay, so one of the things that's really powerful that council members can do is bring people together, you know, to, um, and that's, that's something that I've, I've been doing, you know, on this issue since I've been in council. One of the first things I did is I initiated um, Big Fix Houston, which I am so happy that has now been, uh, you know, um, a, a taken over by, um, by, by all you know, the animal rescue organizations, Unity for Solution primarily, but also brought in the city and the county to focus, you know, in, in the month of February, which is World Spay Month, you know, to have a, the, the second Saturday in February be um, recognized as Big Fix Houston Day for forever. Um, the, and after that, you know, um, in subsequent years, um, uh, I, this, especially this last year, I renamed World Spain Month here in Houston as Love Your Pet Month and, and just focused a whole lot of attention, had hosted a conference in, in District H, um, uh, had um, a, 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 a selfie rescue contest, you know, with, with you and your spayed or neutered rescue pet that w winners were on, 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 are still on billboards around the, the city and the county for the next year. Um, had hosted, I think, nine different events that, that either we offered um, uh, uh, vouchers or actual spay and neuter surgeries that day, you know, um, with partners like um, uh, <clears throat> Canine Angels and you know, the Empty Shelter Project, you know, that came to Denver Harbor, and, and in one day we we spayed and neutered, um, and at the end of February, uh, 473 animals in one day. That makes an impact. Those are all animals that are not going to have babies. You know, that makes a big impact. And um, you know, just shining a light. You know, um, recognizing the good work of uh, organizations. You know, um, you know. 
creating some buzz. You know, people need to be aware of it because truthfully, the month of February is not the only month. I mean, here in Houston, it is always puppy season. It is always kitten season. You know, we need, we need these kinds of efforts all year long. But I think that, you know, that, that that's what some, that what council members could do is to pull people together and to create events and to, um, to keep the conversation really alive. Thank you. I do believe that uh, I am an advocate of animals. They, they don't have a voice, and so we need to be their voice in order to protect animals uh, from abuse and a, a lot of different situations. And the way that I plan to be an advocate is continue to, to be a partner um, in, the, in the solutions for uh, homeless animals and spay and neuter services, and just building relationships with local groups to, to kind of help push our e efforts forward. Uh, I agree. We wouldn't be here if we didn't think animals deserved an advocate and here supporting y'all. Um, and I'm proud that back in 2015 when I worked for State Senator Sylvia Garcia and I've worked for Jessica Farrar in the past, um, I worked with her, right, and, and I got her to run with this idea of an animal wel welfare bill, bill in Texas. It had microchipping in it, it had stuff about rabies, it had creating different levels for dogs, so instead of being called dangerous right away and getting kicked into a shelter and then never seeing your family again, right, it created all these different levels so that owners had a chance to rectify the, situa the situation with their usually dog, right, um, and keep that animal. And that's what it takes is talking about the issue, not just in front of y'all because we're trying to get your endorsement, but talking about it year round because again, it's a public health issue, it's a community issue, four out of 10 Houstonians care about it. So I've got a track record of supporting it way before I've been here and I intend on supporting animal advocates like you all well into the future. And I'm gonna give it a shout out, my girlfriend is here and she also does animal rescue, so. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of ways to be an advocate, and we need all of them. You know, so, so people that are actually doing the work on the streets, you know, rescuing, you know, if you are, if you are at the, um, if you are lobbying, at, you know, the legislators, that's important work. You know, if you're raising money to support animal groups, that's important work. You know, if you're promoting spay neuter, that's important work. You know, the transports, the every, there's so many levels, and, you know, and the animals deserve the advocates. Um, that's, and it, it and, just, I guess that's what I had to say about that. But yes, we, we are all advocates in this room, I believe, and um, every, every job that everyone does is maybe different and it's just as important. Thank you. So um, I think overall we can do a better job as far as uh, uh, utilizing city services. It's one thing to have all these ordinances in place and, and, the, and, the, and the programs available, but if, if people can't, have, can't get access to them, what, what use are they? And so I think people, it, we need to do better as far as outreaching to different communities that can benefit from these uh, programs and services. Um, so they're aware of what's available, what it costs, if there's grants available, if you can't afford it. And so I just think we need to, we need to do a better job as far as uh, getting the information out there to communities that need it. Um, and that'll help uh, alleviate the problem. Thank you. Isabel. You know, Bark is doing the absolute best they can with the resources that we give them. And I think that's one of the main points, right? The resources that we prioritize right now for animal welfare. Um, they can't, you know, they want to expand. They take in 500 animals when they only have the capacity for 150, right? And you all know, you see them trying to work. And there's stuff that we don't let them do as a city, right? We say, technically, you're not supposed to put four animals in one kennel. Technically, you're not supposed to accept animals on a Saturday. And they're not in that business unless they're trying their best. But I think the real question is, are we willing to invest the resources into animal welfare and animal rescue as a city, or are we gonna keep saying that's a niche issue, right, and keep pushing it to the side and pushing it off and pushing it off, even though we have a year-round breeding season, even though we have spay and neuter services, right? And again, it's to that point of where is Everest and how are we getting there, or are we just taking the safest next step because we don't wanna make the mayor mad? Um, so, you know, Bark has come a long way, but, 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 uh, but the city is challenged with funding 
problems, and you know it's that's that's just a reality. So I think that you know that they, despite the progress they've made, we don't have enough and uh, um, uh, resources to really support the work that needs to be done. Part of that is enforcement of the ordinances that are in place. I mean, we have we have laws now that are just there's not enough um, in enforcement that's possible because we are we are just so so short staffed um, the other part is you know um, taking steps to um, uh, uh, collaborate with the county um, that's that is starting to happen I'm tell I'm really proud to tell you I'm part of making that happen you know creating partnerships that hadn't existed with the county before and openness to be talking there's a um, uh, I, I was able to get Judge Hildago to meet with um, with uh, the head of the ARA for the city of Houston, and they are talking really in, in very meaningful ways about how the city and the county can, can take real um, substantive steps to address issues and find efficiencies in working together and, you know, and, and uh, you know, so that we're not duplicating, you know, efforts. So that's another thing. And then, then the, the third piece is, you know, just what, what more can we be doing that we're not doing now in terms of, you know, should there be other um, ordinances? One of the things I've heard about is, you know, should we require, you know, microchipping? Um, okay, but, all right. Well, that, that's, uh, that's a really good question because I know that there are many efforts uh, in the communities uh, around different issues uh, that a lot of partners want to work with the school system. Uh, but I know that the school system has been um, very careful on who they're allowing into schools and what type of programming, programming is allowed. Um, I just really think that uh, meeting with these uh, executives and, and HISD heads and really un having them understand the importance of education, especially in, in, in our elementary schools and teaching these kids that we can break the cycle of homeless animals or uh, inappropriate care for animals. It starts, it starts when the kids are little. And so if we can get into the schools to try to break that cycle, then hopefully we'll start seeing a difference. But it's just a matter of, um, of really connecting, making that relationships, educating them on, on the impact that this can have uh, in our school system. Go back to that idea of community block walks that I want to host quarterly, right? It's again about bringing different groups together. So if we're bringing those PTA groups together, if we're bringing the animal welfare groups together, if we're bringing the environmental groups together, people as they're block walking together create those relationships and so it's less of you're a stranger asking me to do something with our kids and oh, I saw you at that block walk, we've been talking together, let's leverage those community relationships for each other's benefit. And I've also been doing this community work in District H for many, many years with, again, Sylvia Garcia and Jessica Farrar. I've got those relationships. Those people are literally the people I invite to my birthday, and it's as easy as picking up a cell phone and saying, let me take you to coffee in a local place, let me bridge that gap instead of just doing an E intro and hoping for the best. So your, your question was about, uh, about um, getting into HISD. And so I was surprised to hear you say that there had been no partners um, because I've been to schools I mean, I, I, where there was uh, where barrio dogs, uh, where I learned about barrio dogs. When it was a presentation at Sherman Elementary School on how to survive a dog attack. And I'd never seen anything like that. There were children that were sitting on the cafeteria floor and they were telling them, explaining to them, you know, how to act like a tree how to act like a rock, you know, and to lace your fingers together and put them on the back of your neck and don't move. And I'm thinking, this is terrifying, you know, but, but, but it's important. I mean, it, that's the reality in, a, in, in some of our neighborhoods. You know, it, it's dangerous. And so 
I think schools are a great way to, you know, to, to, to educate families. Children come back to their homes and they share with their parents and the parents listen. You know, it's, it, you know we're talking about a culture change that's needed. That's, that's a really good place to start. And so I don't know why it didn't work. Maybe, maybe that's what you ought to look at is why did it not work? Maybe you're not talking to the right people because I know people care and teachers care and principals care. You know, the, the HISD is going through a lot of stuff right now and maybe they're a little bit distracted, you know, but I think that that's not, you know, if that's an effort that, that we shouldn't give up on. So just like we partner with other states to transport animals and to uh, bring in different partners from all over all over the state for uh, the empty shelter projects and so forth, I think we, we can utilize those uh, lines of, of friendship or partnerships to collaborate to, uh, to bring in help, to bring in uh, veterinarians that can help us address and, and a spay and neuter issue or the shortage of, of, uh, of help. Thank you. Along those lines, we've got A&M down the road, right? And for we may have an overall lack of vets, but that doesn't mean that all 100,000 of them are, or it's not even that close, I know. But the, the point being that not all of them are already coming. How can we incentivize that? How can we bring them in and let them have cards for their offices, right? So they see it as a business networking opportunity just as much as a service opportunity. Because what we have to tell them, or the case we have to make is, the hours you spend doing this on a volunteer basis are worth something more than the hours you are, are not having, right, getting paid for that service. And so we have to be very practical. But there's the partnerships, there's the working with the vet schools down the road, and there's maximizing as much volunteer potential, right, to check those folks in, take care of those animals as they're waiting, and get people moving quickly in and out through a cadre of volunteers. It's not just about getting the vets who can do the actual technical surgeries there. It's about getting all of us there in a community. And again, I would love to use um, community centers and make sure that elected officials, right, and myself as a council member are making those spaces free, are getting donations, right, for all sorts of bandages and IVs and all the other stuff you need so that we can reduce the cost as much as possible to, if some people want to get paid, that's fine. Maybe we have a couple more dollars to pay them and make it a better decision to bring them out. Um, so, a&M is actually the only vet school that's in Texas, and not every state even has a vet school, and not all vet schools emphasize the same kind of training. You know, this high volume shelter work is not something that everyone does, and so the states that do provide that are, we're in competition, all of us are in competition with everyone else in the nation who wants those kinds of vets. That's what we need in an urban area like this. So one of the things that's going on right now, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about, you know, partnerships with, you know, with the, with the county and the city. That's part of the conversation right now. The, the number one thing that they, they're talking about right now, partnering together on, is, is lobbying A&M to alter, to shift their training, their program, so that it's, it's uh, uh, um, helping urban cores like Houston, you know, our major cities really desperately need this. You know, so, you know, if their focus is on, on you know, agricultural animals and, you know, um, other, other specialties, we really, we need people, vets, who are trained in this kind of shelter work, you know, and, and um, so that those partnerships are really, are really crucial. And, um, and uh, BARC all actually already offers really good salaries for veterinarians. So I think, you know, um, you know how, do we, how do we attract them? You know, I think that, you know, maybe, maybe you know, a focus group on of veterinarians who can help us understand, uh, you know, what would actually be encouraging to them to come. So, um, again, I have been proud to make this an issue, both when I was working for Sylvia Garcia, before it was popular, before it was fun, to advocate it for it at the state legislature, when the Texas vet shot me down and said, no one should be giving rabies shots but us because everyone is going to 
use it to give rabies to each other. I don't know, right? But the idea is I've gone up against bigger opponents and I've sounded the bell on this issue and I'm happy to do it as a city council member and again, leverage those community resources together because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to see this as a public health issue, both for animals and for our neighborhoods and treat it appropriately. <laughs> so we all know that animal overpopulation and homeless animals are an issue in Houston. And so in order for us to, to get to the root of the problem, just like any other problem, it's going to be through relationships, it's going to be through education, and it's going to be through outreach. And so I, I believe in um, uh, getting the word out, making services accessible, making them affordable, having funding available for those who cannot afford it. And so, you know, I, I've lived in a community where I have felt threatened along with many other families, can't even walk to the store, can't walk to the park. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, been an, it's an issue all over Houston, and I really hope that we can work together to address it. Um, um, just thank you to all of you for the important work that you do. I really have come to appreciate you on a level that I, I didn't, that I didn't really understand before. In my role as a council member, this has been a big focus for me, and I've, I've got a, a very strong track record in really putting my, my, um, my money, my energy, my feet, you know, where, where, where I'm, where I, what I'm talking about now. So um, I, I will continue to do that. There's, a, there's things I'm working on right now that I'm, ex you know, I'm, I'm passionate about. So um, I hope you'll support me to continue that great work. Um, but but it's, I just want to say it's, it's not a problem that's everywhere. It's a problem that's in some parts of our city. It's not a problem in all parts of our city. And, and maybe just maybe making sure that the parts where it's not a problem, that they know that they can help too. That's another big piece of this. And, and actually, PetSet does a very good job of reaching those communities. And thank you for your good work on that. Appreciate you. <laughs>